This week, I want to talk to you on uh, a church built on small groups, and, and really the title of this message is From Crowd to Community. From Crowd to Community. I love crowds, but community is what God desires for us. In 1992, my dad had uh, um, a visitation from the Lord where he said to prepare for harvest and hostility. And for Three decades, Bethany was not a part of small groups. We didn't have small groups. and It was a great church, but there wasn't small groups. And the Lord spoke to my dad and said, prepare for harvest and hostility. And that following year, we had a play, a, a drama at our church called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. And just for my, for my curiosity, was anybody saved or became a part of Bethany during Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames? Would you wave at me real quick? Wave and look around. Look at the people, man. It's crazy to see these people got saved in Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. I remember the, the person who introduced the play every night, he would say, and without further ado, Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. Like that. I mean, people wanted to get saved off the intro. But that fall, we saw uh, a little over 18,000 people put their faith in Christ for the first time in one month's time. I was there for that. I was actually a part of the play, and it was my acting that got everybody saved. And <laughs> over over 18,000 people. I'm just kidding, by the way. <laughs> you don't want to see a video of it. It was not great. But 18,000 people put their faith in Christ, and that word from the Lord of harvest came true. What does the church do when 18,000 people get saved? And thankfully, we, we had just that year started a model what we, uh, that was called small groups or cell groups at the time. And we had 52 people who were prayer leaders that had, that had been asked to lead a group in their home. So 52 leaders stepped up and decided to lead a group in their home. And those 52 leaders were able to every night take the people who were being saved and follow up on them and take care of them. And those, those small groups multiplied very rapidly. Uh, in the next few years, we would have over a thousand small groups at the church and the church was really mobilized. And still to this day, we, we've got a little fancy, we called it B groups. And if you haven't been around uh, long and you've hear, heard the term B groups, you wonder what B stands for. Well, B is easy, it's Bethany, right? But also it stands for belong, that, that there's a sense of belonging but this is a church that's built on small groups. So let's talk for a little bit about the value of small groups. Crowds are great. I love going to uh, LSU games, Southern games, Saints games, whatever the games may be, Parkview, what, uh, high school games around here. I love going to, to games. But crowds, you're not known in a crowd. And, uh, and often in churches today, and it's not just a mega church thing, that mega churches get a lot of, of grief when I think mega churches are powerful. Obviously, what we've just seen, feeding 50,000 meals, that's what mega churches are able to do. So don't, read, don't believe everything that you see that's wrong with mega churches. Mega churches are just a bunch of Christians who have assembled themselves together, and it's very powerful. But what's really not okay is if you come into a crowd gathering and you're not known. What, what really matters if you come and you're not seen. And, and, and it's like a football game. You just come and participate. So did Jesus have crowds? Yes, he did have crowds. There were a lot of people that came to hear Jesus preach, and, and he would do miracles, and by the thousands. I mean, um, Jesus did have crowds, but he also had 12 disciples, and those 12 disciples were who he really invested his time in. And crowds are great, but they can also turn negative. We live in a day of crowds. Everybody thinks that they're friends with other people on social media, but you're not friends. You're just a part of the crowd. Crowds can uh, get, they can turn into a mob really quick. And, and, and there's a, an extreme value to small group, to being a part of a small group. And my question is, is it our destiny as Christians to always just participate in a crowd, or does God want us to be a part of a community? And I would like to challenge you today that God wants you to be a part of a community. He wants people to know your name, to know your face. If you're a part of a church and nobody knows your name and nobody knows your face and there's no way to be able to be known, then you're in a dangerous place. Because it's not okay just to come and be inspired and to be encouraged and to be exhorted. Although those things are great. Like just a moment ago, we were worshiping God and I thanked God for thousands of voices lifting up to him. But 
Man, there's something so valuable about being seen and being noticed. Can I get an amen? Do you agree with that? I'd like to read Romans chapter 16, verse 5. This is Paul in his closing to the, the Romans. He greets so many people by name. And I just would like to say that the early church did have crowds. Peter had 3,000 people saved. We know that there were crowds. But the early church was not built on crowds. It was built on community. They knew people's names, and people were in homes. And this is what Paul said. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life. To whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Now, this phrase, church in their house, was used two other times by Paul. One in Philemon chapter 2 and the other in Colossians chapter four, but Paul would talk to the church in their home. And also in the book of Acts, it says, and they met daily in the temple, but also in homes. See, our gatherings this Sunday are powerful. God's presence is here. And I'm telling you, signs and wonders take place. And we are mobilized as an army in this place. But God did not just att- uh, uh, intend for us to assemble in the temple, but also from house to house. And we have to understand that tremendous things happen in this context, but powerful things happen in our living rooms. Powerful things happen in coffee shops. Powerful things happen on Zoom calls, even though you didn't think they could. They, they can. There's six reasons why I believe all of us need to be a part of a small group. Write these down. Six reasons why we all need a small group. Number one, we all need to be noticed. Noticed. It's hard to get noticed in a crowd. Although I will say, I'm pretty good at spotting people from the platform. I had a lady that attended church here for years and she stopped me out in public one day and she introduced herself and she says, I know you don't know me, but I've been going to uh, the South Campus for several years. And, and, uh, and I said, I know. She said, I've never met you before. And I said, well, uh, I, do, I, I do know. And she says, well, where do I sit? I said, you sit in that back corner over there on the third row and you come every other weekend. She said, you do know me. <laughs> but I'm not like that with every person. I'm just telling you. <laughs> she stuck out because in worship, she did like this. It was kind of hard not to see her. <laughs> But it's hard to be noticed in a crowd, and you need somebody to notice. Let me tell you, guys, you need somebody to notice when you're here, and you need somebody to notice when you're not here. Let me tell you, I notice when people are not here. I freaked a guy out one time. He didn't think I knew, and I texted him out of the blue, and I said, man, I ain't seen you in a few weeks. He said, really? You noticed that I wasn't present? I said, yeah, I've noticed. And again, I'm not like, I wish I was like that with everybody. But you need someone to notice when you're present and when you're not present. Because sometimes you just start to float in life and you start to drift. I had someone come up to me and tell me, Pastor, through COVID, I drifted. I fell back into my old habits. I started drinking again. I started gambling again. And, and nobody noticed. And I'm just so glad I showed back up here. And, but nobody called. Nobody texted. Nobody. And man, you need somebody to notice if you're, if you're in the house. You need somebody to notice if you're not doing well. They notice enough to know when you're smiling and when you're not smiling. You need somebody to notice. So number one, the reason why you need a group is you need somebody to notice you. You really need this. Sometimes you don't want them to notice you, but you need somebody to notice you. Number two, you need to be able to take off the mask. When you show up on Easter Sunday morning and you're, and you're best dressed and you're smiling at everybody and you're blessed and highly favored and waving at everybody, you're, you're, you're all good. But I want to know what's going on truly in your mind. What's truly going on? I was in a B group a few years ago with a few guys and we took an overnight trip. And we were sitting around a campfire. And around this campfire, these guys that are all leaders began to share their weaknesses, share things that were going on. And they weren't shocking weaknesses, but it was so refreshing to be able to hear somebody take off the mask and say, yeah, I really struggle with anger. Or yeah, 
I really always am striving because my dad never told me that I was good enough. And I always feel like I'm trying to get affirmation. And and you need a place where you can get real. And a B group or a small group is a place. And you can't get real here. Like, you're not saying a word today, right? You need a place where you're sitting with people and you can say, hey, I'm really struggling with this or this is really my weakness and you can be lifted up and you can be you can be supported in that you need a place where you can take off the mask number three you need some true friends you know today americans say that they're more lonely than ever with every bit of social media that we have and connections and zoom calls and we are we are so connected but yet so lonely. We're so lonely. You need friends that are as close as family. Do you agree with that? You need, you need people that you feel like love you and are, and are with you. Some of us uh, moved from other places and we left our family at different states and literally we have no family here. Uh, wave at me if, you, if, you, if your family is in another place and you're here kind of alone. Wave, 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 wave. Look, guys, look, look how many people don't have family here. Look at that. And, and, and that's why you need friends. You need spiritual friends. You need family because you don't have family here. And then some of you guys have gotten saved and you had friends, but all of your friends do stuff you don't want to do. And you need good friends. You know, there are different layers of friendships. The first layer is acquaintances. They're people that you think you know their first name. You might mess it up. If you see them, you're going to wave at them. Those are called acquaintances. Then the next level would be casual friends. You do know their name. You don't engage with them frequently, but they're just casual friendships. And then the third layer would be close friends. These are people that you really like a lot. You may even go on a vacation with them. You may text them once every two or three weeks. And then there's that fourth layer. And that fourth layer is intimate friends, which these are the people that you're texting almost every day. These are the people that are in your inner circle. And these are the people that God wants to place you with, that you can do life with, that you can pray with, that you can walk with. And this is why you need to be in a small group is because you need friends. Quick recap is you need to be noticed. You need to take off the mask. Number three, you need true friends. Number four is you need support. That same group that I was just mentioning to you a while, a few years ago with these guys around a campfire, one of them two months ago contracted COVID. He didn't respond well, and it was a real, real battle for him. And he ended up in the hospital. And that escalated to where he got to the point where they said, we're going to have to put you on the ventilator. And this guy who was a part of this group was going on the ventilator. You know, it's so interesting. That group hasn't met in a little over a year. But the people he texted in that moment of crisis was the people that he remembered doing life with. It was his B group. Please pray. And so he went on the ventilator. His wife started a group thread, not with his friends from high school, not with his friends from college, not with his workers, not with his B group, and said, here's what's going on. Every day, she began to tell us this is his status, and we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed. And recently, as a pastor, I'm able to go into the ICU and pray for people. I was able to go into his ICU room and pray. And he's still on the ventilator. He's really fighting for his life. As I walked in that room, worship music was playing. But do you know the pictures that were around the room? Pictures of his B group. I walked over to him, laid hands on him. I realized the closest people in his life are his B group. Those are the, these are the pictures around the room with the people that... And I'm, I'm seeing his situation turn around right now. I'm praying for him. If you, if you don't mind, pray with me for him that he would completely recover. But my point in telling you that is this, is that in his darkest moment, it was the B group that he looked to. And guys, I just want to tell you, there are some great Christian people that would have your back 100% if you would invest in those relationships. If you're lonely and you feel like, dude, I don't have, 
Get in a big group with people and invest your heart and your soul with them. And then in your moment of crisis, you're going to know what who to text. You're going to know exactly who to pour out your soul to. It's going to be those people who were in the trenches with you. We stand together through difficulty. We pray with one another through tough times. We help each other with even material needs. You know, it, there's so much material need in the church, but unless you're known and unless you're connected, it's hard to, it's hard to keep up with everybody. But if you're connected to a small group and, and you need a generator when the storm hits, who do you call? <laughs> or you have bills that are coming up and you need people to pray with you, but you never know. People may help you. And I'm telling you, that's what the church is supposed to be. And you need support. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse nine, it says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. You know, you've probably heard of this. There was a, a, a lady small group several years ago and one of the ladies in the group developed cancer and she had to go on chemotherapy. And she was, she was in treatment in Kentucky and all of her ladies of that small group flew up there to be with her. And she was so surprised when they walked in and all of them had cut all their hair off. And they walked in that room without, a, without any hair to show their solidarity with her. That's support. That's support. And you need that type of support. The fifth reason why I think everybody needs to be in a group is you need to grow. Now, I do think that the preaching of the word of God edifies your spirit. I think you'll probably go from here today and maybe remember one point that I say. Maybe you'll put something into practice, but nothing is like sitting around a circle of people dialoguing the scriptures, dialoguing the word of God. How do you feel about this? And what do you think about this? And there's something so powerful about engaging others in conversation about the scriptures. It's absolutely necessary, and you need to grow as a person. And when you engage in a small group, that's exactly what happens. Join a, a, a marriage group and get better in your marriage. Join a, a child raising group and get better raising children. Join a discipleship group and learn the scriptures more. Join a freedom group and get freedom from bondage. But you, you need to grow. Is that right? Yeah. Sanctification, this is all a part of it, is doing life with other people. Guys, this is what I want to, I want to really just lean in on you a little bit. You may be sitting here and say, Pastor, I got relationships. I got family. I got friends. But my question is, do you have spiritual friends? I'm not talking about, let's talk about the Tigers game last night. Or let's talk about whatever is going on. I'm talking about people who can say, let's open our scriptures and dialogue about the word of God. Do you have friends like that? Because it's not just having good friends. It's do you have spiritual friends that can help you grow. Somebody that can actually say, let's pray right now. That's the kind of friends you need in your life. So you need to grow. And the final thing, and the final reason why I feel like you need to be in a part of a group is you need to minister. God has graced every single one of us with a gift. Come on, say this with me. I have a gift. God has called me to give it to the body of Christ. Come on, somebody. You have a gift. Some of you have a gift to speak. Some of you have a gift to give. Some of you have a gift to serve. Some of you have a gift to, to show hospitality. Some of you have administration gifts. Romans chapter 12 tells us all these different gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 gives us gifts. You have gifts. But how do you use those gifts? Some people have used their gifts today. Some people have helped us in hospitality by helping us find a parking place. Some people have greeted us in the foyer. Some people are helping out with kids right now. Some people are serving on the worship team. Some people are serving in production and cameras and all of these areas. But there are thousands of us today that are not mobilizing our gifts 
And we don't do it on a Sunday morning context. So my question is, where is your gift mobilized? Where, where are you allowed to minister? And I'm telling you, that place is in the context of a small group. You are going to exercise your gifts to minister. Some of our pastors uh, on staff today started as small group leaders. Some of you may know Pastor Chuck Stearns. Pastor Chuck started as a small group leader so almost 30 years ago, and now he's a, one of our top pastors here at the church. Uh, Pastor Chris Hodges, who now pastors the second largest church in America, started his ministry leading small groups. But you never know when you begin to minister what God is gonna multiply in you and through you and what that's gonna turn into. Not just a place for you to minister, but also a place uh, where a, a team that can serve together. Like if you were to go on a missions trip, who would you go with? If you were to go do an outreach to the community, who would you go with? You need a place to minister, and that's what small groups are. And guys, I could give you another six reasons why you need to be in a small group, but I'm just gonna leave you on those six because I think they're so important. And let's just recap them real quick. Number one, you need to be noticed. Somebody needs to see your face when you're in the place and when you're not in the place. They need to know if you're doing good or bad. Number two, you need to be able to take off the mask and get real with somebody and tell them what's really going on in your life. Number three, you need some true friends, not just some acquaintances and people who smile at you, but people who are right there in your corner, intimate friends, people that you wanna text all the time. Number four, you need support. When you walk through valleys, when you walk through tough times, you need people who can, who can be that right there with you. Number five, you need to grow in your knowledge of the word, in your sanctification, in your accountability, in your discipline, you need all of those things, and that's what happens in a small group. And number six, you need to minister. You need to be able to pour out uh, your gifts to the body of Christ. And so the way Bethany uh, is set up with small groups is we do semesters because you don't want to be in an eternal small group that goes on and on and on forever and ever. And so we do semester-based small groups where there's a start point and there's a stop point. You can jump in and there's a time for, for it to end. And some people, they never wanna stop. They love each other so much, they, like, it's just they forever committed. And some people can't wait for the semester to be over so they can join a different group, you know? <laughs> so there's wisdom to the semesters. But we have amazing, we have several hundred groups now that are meeting at the church. And, and they're in every phase of life for every type of, uh, of life journey, marriage and young families and college age. And we have prime timers groups. If you don't know, those are people who have a few gray hairs. We have all kinds of groups. And, and, and I just wanna encourage you to join one of them and invest your heart in it and invest your heart in those relationships and see what God will do in those. And uh, directly following the service at all of our campuses, you'll be able to sign up for small groups, but it's also easy to sign up on our website or to sign up on our phone app. You can go on there and you can look at, you can even look at the pictures of the group leaders and be like, oh, that person looks weird. I'm gonna go to another person, you know? <laughs> I'm just being funny, but my point is invest in spiritual relationships. You need them, you need them.